thank you. Do you, you know what ransomed is? You imagine if you were held hostage and they demanded a ransom and uh, you, had, you had no one that can pay for that or you had no one that would want to pay for that uh, or uh, you were sold and you needed to be bought back uh, and again, you have no one willing or no one able to do that. Well, the beautiful thing is about the whole world is we've all been in those situations. We're all uh, held ransom. We're, we're all held uh, in, in slavery because of sin. And we had someone that would come that was one of us to pay for our redemption, paid for our ransom. And that was God becoming man, Jesus Christ. And that's something to sing about. Did you appreciate that song this morning? Let's give the group another huge hand. Thank you very much. Uh, my wife noticed that up on the stage today, we had a number of uh, relatives. So uh, you all know that uh, Doc Tanny and Meg Tanny, uh, husband, wife, they've been part of our church for a number of years, a medical doctor, nurse. Uh, we're in good shape if we ever have any problems in our church, uh, medical problems, because they're, they're always here. Joe, uh, son of Doc and Meg. Pastor John, another son. They have a third son who's an assistant pastor in Waukesha, and they can all sing. Don't you hate that, when the whole family's so talented? And then you have Sister Marion and uh, Pastor Dave, whose mom is sister of Meg and Mary. You, you have the family tree. Okay, so we've got an amazing group up here today, and then a scattering of other great singers as well. Uh, would you stand, and we're going to open in a word of prayer in just a moment. Our first song today is Standing on the Promises. Uh, why is it important that uh, we believe in a God that keeps His promises? Because He's promised us things like eternal life. We don't have eternal life today. We, we are still in our fallible, uh, sin-cursed world and our sin-cursed bodies. But he's promised to give us a new body. He's promised us to never leave us or forsake us. He's promised us everlasting life. That's why it's important to believe in a God that keeps his promises. Amen? And we're going to stand on those promises today uh, as we worship the Lord. Um, and we also want to make sure all of you feel welcome today as you're part of our audience from around the world on live stream, television, and radio. Let's welcome these great folks to our service today. God bless you. And thank you for being part of our service. And let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for the wonderful uh, truths that we're already hearing about in song. And uh, Lord, as we study your word, as we go back to the Old Testament and Genesis, Lord, we just see uh, why all of these things are the way they are. Uh, we, we see that you're an amazing, creative, genius God, but you're also a compassionate, loving, and caring God. But you're holy and you're just, so we have to uh, have our sins paid for, and we can't pay for them ourselves. That's why we're singing about the wonderful promises that you've made to us that anyone who will by faith just trust in Jesus, the Son of God, the, the second person of the Trinity, will be saved. So Lord, as we sing today, help us to think through the words of our songs. As we hear the sermon, help us to think how these truths will apply to our life, to my life. And Lord, as we give to you, and as we even give announcements, Lord, help us to, to be attentive to your calling and your will in our life. We give you this service. We give you today our praise and our glory for you are worthy. We thank you for your promises. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of Serve love. 
loved us while we were yet sinners, he sent his son. His mercy is more. The song we are gonna sing immediately following this talks about this is God. The God who knows our faults, our failures, but still has a plan for us. And this hymn we're singing now speaks of that love. What love could remember no wrongs? That's love. That he literally says, I know you sinned, but I'll forgive it. That's the God we serve. Sing this. Think about the words as you sing. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without but a more shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Riches of kindness, he's lavished on us. Sing this next verse. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is Sing the chorus. Praise the Lord. Please be seated.
Thank you very much. Exceptionally beautiful. God has been good to us, and we have a, a lot to be thankful for. God has uh, placed us in an area that uh, there's affluence around us, and uh, he has blessed us with a lot of property and buildings. We have about 50 uh, five acres of property between the church and the college, 16 buildings that we own. Uh, we're spending a lot of money right now maintaining things. Uh, we have a couple hundred thousand in parking lot improvements happening. You probably saw some of the construction going on this week, and it's very nice when it's new. Uh, everything's all cracked up. They take that out, and they put that brand new stuff in there, and it's, it's amazing, but it's a couple hundred thousand dollars to do all of that. You see the gymnasium, the, uh, we call it the school gym, and we've had, um, I, I don't know how many years, 30 years, we've had the building, we've un, uh, updated the siding a few times, but it keeps uh, warping, and it's just, it, it was a really, really bad shape, and we finally had to pull the trigger, and uh, we're gonna do a really nice, beautiful new siding job. It's already started, they're tearing it off. Again, a couple hundred thousand dollars to make sure it's gonna last. And everything that I'm doing, I'm gonna make sure I don't have to do it again. So whoever's next gets to worry about all of this, I'll make sure it's all good until um, I'm gone. So I say all this to say this. Um, in, in God blessing us with, and, and by the way, we, we put our own efforts and blood, sweat, and tears into these buildings. You know, we saved probably half or more on construction because we did it ourselves, we contracted it, we did a lot of the work. So we're very careful with God's money. Uh, when you give to Quint Road, you give to In Grace, you give to Dayspring Bible College, uh, it's, going, it's going to be stretched very far, okay? I'm not standing here to raise money for us. I'm standing here today to raise money for an inner city church in Inglewood. Inglewood is probably the worst neighborhood in Chicago. All sorts of horrible things happening, and it's getting worse. There is a pastor. His name is Pastor Liddell who's been there a long time. He could have easily moved out. He could have gone somewhere else, but he says, no, this is where God has me. I'm staying here. New Eden Baptist Church, Pastor Liddell's been to our Grace Conference a number of times. I recently heard that they need some help. They have a church building, and right next to it, a dilapidated, it was kind of like an educational building. It's boarded up. It's condemned. It's horrible. It needs to come down. They need money. Uh, another church in Florida and us are going to raise the money to tear that down and put up a basketball court. They can start using this piece for working with the kids in the community. We've raised so far about 4000 We want to raise 20000 So if God has placed on your heart, let's, and we send money all over the world. We send money uh, for earthquake in uh, in the Caribbean, or we'll send money to build an orphanage in uh, Myanmar. Uh, you know, we've given money to Africa and Asia, a lot, lots of different places. I think we need to send money next door and, and to help our brothers and sisters in the inner city of Chicago. I feel passionately about this. I've already said we're going to do it. So don't make me look stupid. And I don't have that big of a checking, uh, checking account. So if we could all come together, and even if it's a small amount, give toward it, just put down Chicago Church, and uh, we will finance that uh, tearing down that building, put a basketball court in there. And there's another project. I said, what else would you need? Because it seemed like a pretty small number. Uh, and they weren't even asking. You know, it just kind of came to us that they had this need. And he said, oh, it would be great if we could um, get a couple of buses because we used to bus kids and we used to have all these kids, but all the buses broke down. We had to get rid of them. So that would be the next step. We're not asking for that today. But if we do hit our, our target, we're going to do another fundraising for New Eden Baptist Church, Inglewood, Chicago, Illinois, and maybe get them some, some buses so that they can get the, the kids into their ministry. So would you consider that, um, uh, doing that for the Lord? Now, Pastor John's going to come and talk a little bit about an, some exciting news we've had from our broadcast of In Grace in Russia, and we've got some feedback, and then we'll take our offering. All right, so as many, as many of you know, we went on TBN Russia a few months ago, and in faith said we're going to do this and we asked for support and all of you were very supportive with your funds and your prayers and it's awesome when god allows us to see some of the results of that faith so let's put up some of these letters and they come from all over uh asia and over in europe uh tamara said i like very much the program about the last day of jesus it was very strong let's go to the next one nikita the program is scientific and spiritual at the same time it's great to see god's glory through his creations 
from Russia. And that, this one's from UAE. Super interesting program. Thank you. Blessings from Olga. Elena said, how impressive is all that God created? God is great. Praise God from Bulgaria. In Turkey, Olga tuned in, said, I have never watched your channel before. I'm on vacation in Turkey now, and your channel's the only one Russian channel in the hotel. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> like, what are the odds? This church, our pastor, get somehow in Turkey, speaking to a Russian person. It's amazing. I watched some of your programs, and one program caught my attention. It was about dinosaurs and archaeological excavations. What is the name of this program? How can I watch other similar programs like this one? What's amazing to, to realize is we, we may watch a program and we may be like, okay, dinosaurs doesn't interest me. But then Olga watching in Turkey, this gets her attention and gets her ready to hear the gospel. Let's go to the next one. Raisa, I think this program will be especially useful for secular people. Many do not believe in God, explaining it by evolution. This program shows that God created all we see from Russia. Let's go to the next one. Svetlana, it's a specific program in a good sense. It shows the story of the planet from the point of view of the Bible. Very interesting, catching attention. It was a good experience. I like it. It's good. Okay, this is amazing. Okay, this is the, this is the one right here. Maxim, my wife is Muslim. I'm Christian. This is from Kazakhstan. I like watching your channel. My wife never watched it with me. But today, I saw her watching the program in grace. She asked me when the next program will be, and I pray for her to be saved one day. Isn't that awesome? In a country across the ocean, a, a, a language that we do not speak, the programs are going and the gospel is present to reach a Muslim spouse of a Russian-speaking person in Kyrgyzstan. Isn't that awesome? Let's give God a hand for that. So awesome. And we, we get to be a part of that. That should make your jaw drop and your eyes should open a little wider and say, I can be a part of something like that, spreading the gospel around this planet. It is awesome. Let's pray as we take up the offering. Lord, thank you so much for this church and for a place that you can use people, people that are willing to follow your word, our pastor taking the lead, making these programs going on a, a television station across the ocean, speaking a different language to reach a group of people that desperately need you and need the truth. What a blessing it is to get some feedback from people that are being blessed because of it, reaching their unsaved spouses, friends, relatives, and we don't even know all of it. We thank you, Lord, for working through us and through our offerings and our gifts back to you for all that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to give towards this church in Chicago. May we be found faithful as we give back to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is awesome to be in this place this morning to worship God and to, to hear that song, be able to sing that song, This is God. I hope, I hope your hearts are all drawn to worship him. One of the ways that you can really get close to God let's put up that slide for family camp, is two weeks from now, you can make plans to join us up in Wisconsin, right off of a lake where we open God's word and we have a church service together up, up at family camp of Whitewater, Wisconsin. Now, we call it family camp, but it is for everyone. Everyone, no matter your age, you are a part of our church family and we want you to join us. So we will still be having a service here, but it'll be a live stream from the preaching happening up there. So hopefully you're all following me. This is in two weeks. Um, so make your plans to make that trip. It's not far. It's a little less than an hour. And uh, you can join us up there and be very close to God up in Wisconsin. Now, if you haven't been paying attention or you're surprised, and this is the first time you've seen this slide, and like, whoa, family camp is August 4th through 7th, and that looks like fun. There's t-shirts, there's tents, a beautiful lake, a rope swing. I want to go. You can still go. And even if you don't want to spend the night, you can drive up for the day. Spend one day, spend two days. And we would love to have you there. You will not regret it. It's a chance for us to get together, not in suits, but in casual clothes and talking with each other and enjoying fellowship as a family. So I hope you all will consider that. And I look forward to seeing you up in Wisconsin two weeks from now. Hello, my name is Grace. And we're so grateful you came to worship with us this morning. But may I ask, 
During the next moment, would you please silence your cell phone? We are on national television. Also, if you've come with small children and feel more comfortable keeping them with you, we have a wonderful family room with wide windows where you can observe the entire program. We have a nursery, toddler's program, and a Bible Quest program for children where they will learn from the Word of God as well as have a wonderful fun time during the hour. You can find more information right now from people of our care team located in the back of the auditorium. Welcome once again to Quinton Road. Written thousands of years ago, every page, every story inspired from God. Do they apply to me? Is the Old Testament obsolete? With Pastor Jim Scudder, Jr. The Old Testament has such epic stories, doesn't it? That's why I'm excited to study it, and it's going to be amazing. But we call it old. Does that mean it's old, meaning irrelevant? Can, can, can we actually learn something from the Old Testament in 2022 that will help us today? How is that possible for such an ancient book? Well, fortunately, we serve a God who is outside of time, and all of man's problems are basically the same. Uh, you know, 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 20 years ago, our problems are almost always the same. And so the answers coming from the Creator uh, are timeless. So let's talk about obsolescence. Do you ever feel like you're going obsolete? Uh, it seems to me like sometimes we do. So as we've been doing in this series, I've been asking you to contribute something that you used, but your kids or grandkids might not know what it is, okay? And so we've had some great contributions. Last week was a Walkman. How many of you remember having a Walkman? Uh, the week before was a rotary telephone, and, and the, the, the kid we picked to come up could, didn't know how to do it and was just intrigued by such of a silly design, you know? Uh, and we had something else up there. What else did we have up there? I forgot. See how obsolete I am already? What was it? Slide yeah, slide projector. Right. Okay, so I have something else uh, hidden under the mystery table. Obviously, this is a smaller item. One of you brought this in to us. I need a kid to come up and help me decide what this is. So raise your hand if you're a kid and you want to come up. Did I mention it's... It's a $20, um, not, it's not your wage, it's just a thank you, 20 bucks. So, okay, come on up, right there. Yep. All right. Are you ready for this? You're not, are you? Okay. All right, stand over here so everyone can see you, and then just make sure the mic's up by your mouth. Uh, so when I unveil it, I want you to, to look at it and, and tell us if you know what it is, and then if you know what it is, tell us how you think it works. Ready? A timer. Okay, hold the mic really close. Say again. A timer. A timer. Okay, you can, you can actually pick it up and look at it. You don't know what this is? Okay. How many of you know what this is? Okay. So how many of you had one? Right? So i just tell you this. In the 80s, this was the thing to have. 3.2 million people at its height had a pager. Most of them were Motorola. This is a Renegade. The company named uh, as Renegade. Oh, no, it's actually Motorola. Sorry. Motorola Renegade. Okay. So um, this was a, it's, it's a critical communication device. I know that doesn't seem like that to you. But uh, first responders, doctors, pastors um, would carry, if you, if you needed to, to get a message and you're out in the field and you needed to get a message, this would beep. And it would display, at least on the one I had, this one doesn't work, but it would have a phone number. And you would call the number, and they would tell you what the message was. It's a one-way communication device. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty high tech. You like that thing? You want to hear the sound again? You don't want to hear the sound? She thought it was a timer, so that's pretty cool. Okay, put that back on the table. We're going to give you a huge hand and 20 bucks. 
Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is, you might want to spend it quickly because cash is going obsolete too, okay? Give it to him. Give her a huge hand. That was great. <laughs> so far, they, the kids really don't know what this stuff is. And by the way, uh, if you bring us stuff, you can give it to my wife, Karen. Give it to our, our administrative assistants, our Care Connect teams. Um, and and just uh, we'll, we'll take it. We'll hold on to it until we use it. Uh, we've got some other. It doesn't have to just be technology. So just think of whatever that we used to use. Something, and, and I don't want it to be something that your you know, great, 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 great grandparents use because then I won't know what it is. Um, I want it to be something that you might have used or you used and uh, your kids or grandkids won't know what that is. And certainly a, a pager, beeper. Uh, why do we call it a beeper? Because it beeps, right? Isn't that funny? So anyways, uh, things uh, are going obsolete, but Isaiah 40 verse 8 tells us, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. You believe that? Amen. So we have something here that's not going to go obsolete, and when we use the word old, does that mean that we're saying it's, it's out of date, it's old, meaning it's not useful to us anymore? No, it just means that we have a New Testament. In other words, that uh, since Jesus came and uh, his, his apostles, many of them were penmen, moved along by the Holy Spirit to write scripture, and, and others gave us what we call the New Testament. But it doesn't mean the Old Testament is obsolete at all. Some teach this. There's a very popular television and radio personality that is teaching this. Not, he's not saying that it's obsolete, but he's certainly minimizing the Old Testament. And I think there has to be a balance, right? We, we, aren't, uh, we certainly are living in a different day, a different age, uh, where, where we're not going to a temple, we're not sacrificing animals as they, they did during that time. But there's so many principles and so many uh, projections from that time to Christ and beyond that we have to know what it says. We cannot ignore the Old Testament, especially in our modern day when we have turned everything that God said upside down. It's, it's incredible to me how many of those things we find that God has said in the very first verses of the Bible. Uh, he's laid things out, like how do we get here? He, he laid out uh, marriage. He laid out gender. He, all of this is, is purely laid out in the very first pages of our Bible. So if we don't know that section of the Bible, then we're not going to have good answers for people. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at first something in the New Testament. We're going to use that as a springboard to jump over to uh, find out what, where that is in the Old Testament. For instance, Romans 11, verse 36, is talking about of the Lord, or of God, for of him, the Lord, and through him, so of him, through him, and to him, are all things. That verse clearly tells us that we're here not by accident, we're not here by random processes, over millions of years, we're here for a purpose. We're here for a reason. And when you don't know that, you're going to be drifting through life aimlessly, trying to grab at things that will satisfy you and bring you purpose, and you're gonna find yourself empty every time. That's why we need to know what we're gonna study today. Jesus said in Mark 10, verse six, from the beginning, of creation, God made them, okay? We're also gonna talk about God made them male and female. Why is this important? Well, because God has designed it this way, but we're also gonna look at the practical and even scientific things of how we know gender today. My title is, Don't Make Me Out of a Monkey. You've heard of Don't Make a Monkey Out of Me? No, I'd like to reverse that and say, don't make me out of a monkey. You've heard the old joke. And I usually don't tell old jokes. If I heard it and if I've used it, I try not to use it again. But then you never laugh. You laugh at the old ones, the ones I've heard a thousand times. When the boy went to the mom and said, mom, how did we get here? And she said, well, God created us. And the boy said, well, I asked dad. And he said, we came 
uh, from monkeys. And she said, well, that was his side of the family. <laughs> See, you laugh at those. You've heard it a thousand times. I'm going to give you another one later. Oh, my goodness. So, so God is creating, and in the middle of the sixth day, he creates the most amazing, incredible creature, uh, his masterpiece, one that could walk upright all the time, uh, one that could paint a masterpiece, one that could marvel at a sunset, one that could play a harp, one that could invent a pager. On day one, the Bible tells us that God created space, time, and matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, that's time. The heavens, that's space. Matter is the earth. And from those things, he created light on day one, and from those things, he created everything else. Day two, he divided the waters from above, from the waters from the below, with the rekia, the firmament. On day three, he created the land. He created the, the things that would uh, adorn the land, the grass, the, the herbs, the, the, the plants, the trees. On day four, he created the sun and moon and stars. By the way, if you think each day of creation was an age of millions of years that God used evolution to create, what do you do with that? God created the plants and the trees on day three, and day four, he created the sun. So there's a big problem with that, right? You say, well, you know, how, did, how was there light on day one and the sun on day four? Well, there's light. Uh, God is light. Jesus is light, right? Uh, there's plenty of supernatural occurrences of light in the scriptures. So God created a supernatural, uh, maybe even a temporary light source. And then on day four, he created the sun, moon, and stars. Um, the, the Hubble telescope uh, astounded us when they aimed it at a dark place in the sky and, and left the shutter open for a long time and found out that there were hundreds of galaxies. Each galaxy has a hundred or two billion stars in it, and that little patch of the sky we thought that was, was black, billions and billions and billions of stars, and now we have the James Webb telescope, and it is blowing them away. The bigger the telescope, the better the microscope, the more astounded we are at the vastness and complexity of our creation. So friends, these advances in science is actually hurting the evolutionists. It is because they can't believe what they're finding. Okay, so God created the sun, moon, and stars, and when it says he created the stars, he created the stars also. It's kind of like, oh, by the way, a number of stars is the sand of the sea. How would we have known that? The Bible says that. How would we know that? With our eyes, how many stars can you see? Thousands. When we got telescopes, you, you, we suddenly realized there was more than thousands. But we never ever thought there would be as many stars as grains of sand in the sea, but now we know there are. The Bible knew that thousands of years ago. That's why I have great trust in this book. Okay, all of it, all of it. So day five, God filled the skies, God filled the water. Birds, uh, fish, incredible creatures. I love uh, to fly, I love to get into the air, I love to dive, I like to go into the water, places that God did not necessarily intend us to be but incredible things in the sky and under the sea. On day six, he created the animals, the, the creatures of the land. And then we come to verse 26 of Genesis chapter one. And God said, and I'm just gonna give you a little Hebrew, this is Elohim. Okay, Elohim is plural, said, this verb said is singular. Let us, obviously a plural pronoun, make man in our image. So we have, we have plural and we have singular in the same phrase. Elohim, plural, said, singular. Let us make man in our image. So what are we seeing here? Well, we Christians believe this is a reference to the three and one, the Trinity, one God, not three gods, one God, three persons, Father, Son, Spirit, all co-equal, co-eternal, different, different uh, responsibilities, but they're all, they're all one God. And we see it here in the very early pages of Scripture. Well, some people say, well, um, that's the, uh, they call it an editorial we, you know? Uh, and I've actually done this before. I was flying by myself, and you're talking to the controllers on the radio, and uh, you, I don't even know why, 
we, uh, sometimes uh, instead of saying I, I would say we. And, and I don't know why we do it. Maybe it's because you're lonely in the airplane. You don't want to feel like there's more people in there than, than just yourself. But it's, it's actually quite common to say we instead of I. Is it the editorial us and our? No, God wouldn't do that. God is accurate. God is particular with what he says. It's, he's not doing that. Some people say, well, it's, it's God in his majesty. He, he can't just say me or I because he's so majestic and, and so creative. And, and believe me, he's majestic and creative. But again, he's not going to say we or us if it's just him, if there's one. Okay? So we have three Elohim with a singular verb said. Okay. And, and some people would point out in the Hebrew, there are places that that happens. But let me tell you this, it happens again in chapter three. Okay. This is a reoccurring theme. And then we find it throughout scripture. You see the spirit of God. You see one like the son of God in the old Testament. Of course, in the new Testament, we find the father, son, and spirit at the baptism of Jesus. Don't we? Three in one. This is an important point that I don't want to gloss over, and it really helps us understand the Scripture. The plurality of persons within the nature of one God. And then uh, verse 26 of Genesis 1 continues, and let them have dominion. This is the the creatures that he's going to make in his image, in their image. These creatures that are going to be in the image of God are going to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So this is what we were designed for. This is why we were here. God created all the things for us to enjoy and for us to rule and and maintain and give him glory and fellowship with him in all of these things. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So we're made in the image of God. Now that's kind of hard for us to understand, but I know this tells me several things. Number one, we are different than everything else he created. We are not descendants of Apes, or monkeys, or even ooze, ooze. The problem with evolution, the problem with the Big Bang, is that you still have something exploding. You have something developing. You have ooze that's hit by lightning. Is kind of kind of how they say life began after the big after billions of years after the Big Bang, so called. Where did the lightning come from? Where did the ooze come from? Where what exploded? There, something came from something in all of those theories. But the Bible said, ex nihilo, out of nothing comes something. And, and God can do that, can't he? God can do that. So how are we like God? Well, we know we're different than the animals. We are not descendants of animals. If you tell people, if you tell teenagers that they came from animals, they're going to start acting like animals. Why are we having the problems that we're having in our society today? Because we've told them that they're random accidents, that they're descendants of animals. How are we like God? How is it that we are like God? We're not God. (laughs) Some people take that too far, don't they? And that was actually part of the first sin with Adam and Eve. The devil used that temptation, do you want to be like God? He's holding back on you. He's not, he's not giving you everything he could give you. That's the lie. We're going to examine that lie today in the, in the context of gender. So how are we like God? Well, someone wrote it this way, and I, I believe I couldn't have said it any better. And they said, we are like God in three different ways. First of all, we're like God mentally. We are made with the ability to reason. This is how we're different than any other creature. We have the ability to reason. We are made with the ability to choose. We, have, we are a reflection of God's intellect and freedom. Let me illustrate that with real life examples. Anytime someone invents a machine, the quote continues, writes a book, paints a landscape, enjoys a symphony, calculates a sum, or names a pet, 
he or she is proclaiming the fact that we are mentally made in God's image. Do you see the monkeys sitting down and enjoying symphonies from instruments that they've created and and songs that they've written? You do not see that. We are different, very, very different. We are made in the image of God mentally. One of our In Grace episodes that I very much enjoyed was a, it was going to be a one-part series to go up to Fairbanks, Alaska in the middle of the winter when it's the coldest and the darkest and to see the aurora borealis, the northern lights. And so we went up there, my wife and I, our film crew, and it was an amazing experience. But while I was on the airplane going up there, I was sitting next to a man, and we struck up a conversation. It turns out he is a champion, world-class ice carver. And he was going to Alaska to Fairbanks for their big international ice carving competition and exposition. I didn't know all of this was happening while we were going to be there, but it was. And so I was amazed at this. How many of you have seen a a beautiful ice carving? You probably all have. How many of you have seen one? They're incredible. You, You have to give it to that sculptor. But then I found out not only is this big competition going on, and I was able to interview a bunch of people, but the place we were staying up north of Fairbanks had an ice museum, and inside, even in the summer, they kept it cold enough for all of these beautiful ice carvings to be on display. And I said, can I interview you guys? And they said, sure, the ones that ran it. So I'm going to show you a clip from Ingrace. To, here's what I'm going to try to do, is show you how we're made in the image of God in the area of creativity. That these animals don't have this ability. They don't have this desire. They don't have this, uh, the, this need to, to make things and to make things interesting and beautiful and, and to outdo themselves the next time. Another thing that I said, you know, this ice subliminates, it, it eventually, even though it's cold enough, it's, it shrinks and shrinks, and they have to either uh, remake pieces of what's on display, if it's in a museum, or they have to start all over. I said, what does that feel like as an ice carver for you to, uh, for, your, for your masterpiece to go away? You know? And so they answer that in this interview. We'll play that now. Also working hard to run the World Ice Art Championships event in Fairbanks was world-class ice sculptor Steve Bryce. Steve and his wife Heather created the Aurora Ice Museum back at the China Hot Springs Resort where we were staying. Steve, great to have you on today and looks like you have quite the workshop happening here in Fairbanks. Yeah, what we're doing is uh, we're teaching some people kind of uh, how to sculpt ice. In 96, Kevin and I, we uh, carved two jousting knights. Yeah, we saw those. We we have kind of a replica of that at Uh at the hot springs. But uh, uh, the ones that we did were uh, larger than life size. Wow. Uh, Maybe 50% larger than life size. That competition set me on fire, and I've been on fire ever since. I love creativity because I I believe it's a gift from God. Yes. Where does this come from? Well, it's a gift from God. And... (laughs) Every time I forget that, uh, (laughs) it it doesn't uh, do me well, that's for sure. Yeah. The World Ice Art Championships were amazing, but so was the Aurora Ice Museum. When we got back to China, we talked with Steve's wife, Heather Bryce, about this awesome place. I just thought it was amazing how even out of a block of ice, God gave us the ability to create something absolutely gorgeous and breathtaking. That's a theme that this whole week is just the creativity of God. You know, you look at the snow on the branches, the auroras, the many things that he gave to us to enjoy. Playable xylophone. Oh my goodness. So. What? When I first built it, you could play the Alaska flag song on it, but it's not tuned right now. Tuned? Mm -hmm. You have to tune an ice xylophone. You can tune it. It's based on how thin they are and how long they are. All right, so what do you guys, what would you like to sing? Mary had a little. (laughs) Jeez. (laughs) Okay, so I'm just gonna stick to uh, TV hosting and pastoring. 
This is kind of the centerpiece of the place. This was originally 1996 World Ice Art Championship piece. Um, this is a recreation, but it was probably about two thirds this big. Wow. So, so ice will shrink, mm -hmm. sub sublimate. Sublimate. Yeah. Okay. So it just kind of slowly goes away, and I think mm -hmm. some of these pieces had to be re recreated. And yes. So all of that. I probably put a hundred hours every year into this piece. Wow. New legs, new reins, new detail. Uh -huh. The shield obviously needs to be replaced soon. So the bodies. When you have art that's slowly disappearing, does that kind of kill you a little bit? For me, it's in the making, and uh -huh. that's why I love the competition so much because it's it's just all inclusive. You're totally focused on what you're doing. Um, and as long as you get a good photo at the end, I'm satisfied. I'm never completely happy with what I've done. Mm. I haven't So yet. maybe you're okay with it slowly disappearing. Yeah, yeah. And, um, there's some like life lessons there because there's a lot of things that we'd love to have just absolutely perfect, but we're never going to really achieve that. Exactly. But we can, you know, with the Lord's help, I think, get closer and closer every day. It was interesting when we interviewed Heather, you know, we said, was it really, you know, is it kind of hard to see your creativity, you know, melt away. And she's like, no, the joy is in making it and then presenting it to the people to see. And she's like, then after that, you know, it's fine. And I just thought that was interesting, just how the joy is in being creative. Yeah, and God gives that creativity. And when I asked her about that, she seems to have never really considered where did creativity mm -hmm. come from? But all of that, you know, art and, and whatever, all of that comes from God. Right. Have you ever wondered about where does creativity come from? Like your desire to do all, let's try this, or it shows me that we have been created. You know, there's mm -hmm. an amazing intelligence that's creative that wants us to do that too. Yeah. I haven't ever wondered where it came from, I guess. Yeah. It, it's just been always with me. Right. So it's a gift. Yeah. And you know, I think everyone has that in some way. You know, mm -hmm. I'll never be able to do anything like this, nor play the xylophone. But we all have, you know, creativity within us. So I think it speaks to a creator that is like that. You know, he, he loves to see what we, what we can come up with, if it's good, you know, if it's something that will bless. And this, this is really you. What uh, God's uh, creation, his chief creation can do. And it's astounding when you see the art, the beauty, the the technology, the things that, that man is able to invent. Again, we gotta make sure it's always good. It is always uh, in accordance with, with what he wants and never uh, use any of that for evil. The quote continues though, how are we like God? Well, we're, we're like him mentally, but we're also like him morally. Uh, the, the person said, we were created in righteousness, we were created in innocence, we are a reflection of God's holiness. For instance, <clears throat> they said, Whenever someone writes a law, recoils from evil, praises good behavior, or feels guilty, he is confirming the fact that we are morally made in God's own image. And third, they said we are like God socially. We were created for fellowship. We reflect God's triune nature. We reflect God's love. Every time someone marries, makes a friend, hugs a child, or attends church, he is demonstrating the fact that we are made in the social likeness of God. Do you see how we are in the image of God? We're different, we're not animals. God has made us like him in many, many ways. And we reflect him, and we should reflect him with our lives. Let's continue in Genesis 2, verse 7, where Genesis 2 gives us a little more detail on Genesis 1. Okay, so Genesis 1 goes through everything that happened on the seven days of creation. Genesis 2 fills in some of those gaps. So Genesis 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Oh, doesn't that make you feel good? You are dirt. People have called you that, but now it's a compliment. You're right. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, from dust to dust. It is true, we were made from dust, we leave as dust our mortal, uh, sin-cursed body. So we're formed from, boy, there's humility in that, isn't there? What can we glory in if we're made of dirt? Couldn't he have used gold? 
Couldn't he have used gemstones? Why dirt? (laughs) Because there's nothing to glory in, in and of ourselves. But then the second part of the verse says, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is where we, some people think when you die, you just cease to exist. No, no. You were made an eternal being in the image of God. You will never cease to exist. There's two destinations for every person that dies. There's one of two. And you need to make sure you know where you're going before you die because you're a living soul. So we were made from dirt, but now we have imbued in us this incredible substance that is mysterious that science will never, ever be able to measure or calculate, and that is the breath of God. What happens when someone dies? It's when they stop breathing. It was a very poignant moment, sitting by my dad's bedside for hours and hours. We knew he was going to die. We didn't know when, but suddenly I looked over and he wasn't breathing. He had instantly gone from living in this body to his eternal soul being with God forever and ever. What is life? What is, what is breathing? What is this? It's mysterious. It's supernatural. So every pr- person listening to my voice, God is supernaturally giving you life, giving your lungs without even having to think, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Your heart's beating without even thinking about it. These are all things, saved or lost, that God is doing for you every moment. God combines this supernatural substance from this very common normal substance, and this combination makes us unique in creation. And this is why we need to protect human life from the womb to the tomb. This, without this, we wouldn't know the value of human life, but because of this, we do. We are made in the image of God. Therefore, we need to stand up and protect life because it's from God. Genesis 1, 27, we'll go back and continue reading the creation account. In the second part of the verse, it says, male and female created he them. So we have two genders that were created and only two he did this for the good of his creation he did this for his glory anytime we go outside of that design we're hurting ourselves we're hurting other people and the most uh the worst part of all of that is we're hurting god even the word sex the word when we use the word sex to define the genders, the male and female sex, the word comes from Latin and it literally means distinct, it means to divide and to separate. The word sex means to divide and separate. So even those that don't believe in the scriptures, every time you're using the word sex to, to, to talk about uh, the genders, the male and female sex, you're actually talking about the, the, the differences that, that God made to divide and to separate. And he separated humans into two groups, two sexes. Each are distinct, but each are valuable. Both are reflecting God's image. Both are reflecting God's likeness. Think about all the description, the, the distinctions between men and women. Of course, the, obviously are, the obvious are the physical. We know there are differences physically between men and women. But think about all the other differences. Think about if we didn't have women in this world, we would have nothing hanging on our walls. We'd have very uh, bare and boring homes. If we would even have homes at all, I don't know. We might prefer, you know, living under a a thatched roof, but she's not going to put up with that, so you're going to make a nicer roof for her, and maybe some walls, maybe some nice, uh, you know, finished walls, maybe a nice floor. You're going to put shelves up for all the knickknacks that she wants to put on those walls. You know she's going to buy signs that say live, laugh, love, breathe. <laughs> We're different. Nothing wrong with that. God made them to, to enhance uh, life. And of course the obvious is, is for multiplication, right? I mean, but, but listen. Satan is a deceiver. He is a liar. And one of his big lies recently is God made a mistake. It's called transgenderism, transsexualism, gender identity disorder, gender dysphoria. 
And it's basically a feeling that your biological or your genetic or physiological gender does not match your gender that you identify with or perceive yourself to be. And so people are confused and people have these feelings that, that they were, there was a mistake. That God made a mistake is really what, what they're saying. So let's say you put aside the Bible, which I will not do, because if you put aside the Bible, you have nothing. But let's say for a moment we put aside the Bible and we look at this issue of gender. Scientifically, we have, each person has a pair of sex chromosomes in every cell. The Y chromosome is present in the male sex, which we have an X and a Y. Women have two X chromosomes. No matter what you do, cosmetically, surgically, medically, you still, if you're a man, have a Y chromosome. That will not change. Now, what is this? Why? It's God, God making us unique and different and complementary. Both equally valuable, as we're going to see in a minute, but, but, but different. Now, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, it still takes one man and one woman to create offspring. It, it does. You have to have that. Okay? So let's say you take the Bible out of the equation. You still have serious problems when you come to this whole area of gender. And, and by the way, what are we to do with these people that are confused? Well, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you, um, no matter if the gender distortion that you're feeling is hormonal, physiological, or spiritual, it can be overcome and healed through faith in Jesus Christ and through walking in the Spirit of God each and every day in reliance on the power of the Spirit. That's the answer to that problem or any problem that we're having, okay? Now, this isn't a sermon about that, but certainly had to address that. Genesis 1.28, God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. You can't multiply without one man and one woman. Now, there's a little more detail that Genesis 2 gives us on the creation account of Genesis 1. In Genesis 2.20, and Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowls of the air, to every beast of the field. What a job that would be. I think it'd be a blast. I think they had very descriptive names. And I think we can actually still see some of those descriptive names in the animal kingdom. But, uh, you know, what do you, what do you do when this animal comes by that kind of looks like a horse, but he's really long legs and a super long neck. What do you do with that? Well, let's call it a giraffe, you know? What, what fun that must have been. But for Adam, there was not found any help meet for him. So all the animals had uh, pairs, but this Adam didn't have a help meet. He didn't have a partner. He didn't have uh, a companion. <clears throat> so... The Lord, in verse 21, God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. How many of you have had surgery and you were put out with anesthesia? They say, okay, you're going to count to 10. I've had it a few times. One, two, nothing. Like, man, I could use that every night of my life. <laughs> the problem is when you wake up and whatever they did to you hurts, plus you probably have nausea and all, all these other problems. But man, when, when God put him out, man, I think he was out. He caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took out one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord had God had taken from man, made he a, a woman and brought her unto the man. And the story goes like this. God said, Adam, I need to find you a, a helper uh, I'm going to make this beautiful creature, and you're not only going to be amazed at her beauty, but she's going to be kind, she's going to be a hard worker, she's going to cook for you, she's going to bear your children, when you discover clothes, she's going to wash them for you, it's going to be incredible. <laughs> Adam's like, wow. God said, yeah, she's never going to talk back, you're never going to have any arguments, it's going to be amazing. Adam's like, wow, this is, this is amazing. What's this going to cost me? God says an arm and a leg. He said, what can I get for a rib? It's terrible. 
Terrible, terrible. I can't believe the pastor said that joke. It, it's good, though. It's good. It's okay to laugh, right? It's okay to laugh. <laughs> what can I get for a rib? So from the rib, the Lord God uh, made woman, brought her unto the man, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And here we have the creation of the woman. Why a rib? Why a rib? Well, one person has noted that when you remove a rib, part of a rib, and they do this in, in a bone graft surgery, it can regrow within a few months if you leave a certain part, portion of it. You remove the rib and the cartilage. So that's interesting. Also, one author suggested that it was to show that they were actually created the same, the same being, two halves of a whole. And, and that's true, I do believe, when you look at uh, husband and wife. And God didn't take something from Adam's head so that she would have dominion over him, nor did, she, did God take it from his foot so that he could trample on her. He took it from Adam's side. Companionship, equality. And you find that in Scripture. And Adam celebrates this creation of Eve. He recognizes her as distinct but complementary, as his partner. And we see the, the relationship there. In verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. Oh, all of a sudden, what do we have? We have here marriage, don't we? And shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. So we have marriage. What is marriage? Marriage is a permanent covenantal relationship between one man and one woman for life. That's what it is. That's the ideal. That's what God created us for. Obviously, there are times when we have conflicts and problems and, and issues and uh, divorce happens, but this is the design. One man, one woman for life in a covenantal relationship. And when a husband and wife come together in marriage, they join each other in body, soul, and spirit. And, and from that, we see three in one, don't we? We see the Trinity again. Body, soul, and spirit. They become one. And you have the husband, you have the wife, and you have the children. You see the Trinity within the family unit as well. So God had all this design to reflect him. We are made in his image. Now what are we supposed to do? We have Adam, we have Eve, we have the, gar the animals, we have the garden, we have all of these, this, this beautiful creation. What are they supposed to do? Verse 28, we go back to Genesis 1. The second half says, replenish the earth. What does replenish mean? Well, it's to fill, okay? Might have been a mistranslation, a poor choice of words. Uh, it kind of harkens back to maybe a gap theory issue. Either way, the word means to fill the earth, to subdue it, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And that's why we're here to enjoy God's creation, to have dominion over it, to, and by the way, some people think, well, work is a curse. How many of you, well, don't raise your hand, how many of you think work is a curse? Depends on what job you have. It's probably not even your job, it's probably your boss that, that uh, you, you have issues with. But work is not a curse. Work was part of the original creation. Adam named the animals. Adam tended the garden and Eve. Uh, work is part of life. Work is part of fulfillment and enjoyment. We we, we, we were designed to work and to have dominion over the earth and to honor the creator in all of that and have fellowship with him at the same time. We'll get into that next time. Genesis 2, verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day. Do you think God needed a break? Do you think he was worn out and he was just really tired, like I did all this creation, I need, I need some rest? No. No, if he's all powerful, that was nothing. It was nothing for him to do all that he created. Why did he rest? Well, he rest for our good, for, our, for a pattern, for, for us to realize that you cannot work seven days a week. You have to take the time to rest. He created this as a model for us. And by the way, why do we have seven days if evolution were true, if the Bible is not true, why would we have seven days? Isn't that interesting? Seven days. You can't add a day, you can't take a day away. Seven days. 
And God rested from all the work he had made. Verse three, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in that, in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So as we are wrapping it up today, let me just say this. God did not need to rest, but he did establish a pattern for us that we need to do, work six days and rest for one. Is that somebody's, hold on, what is this? Hold on. Okay, I got a message for all evolutionists. You were created by a loving and wonderful God who wants to redeem you, he wants to buy you back from sin, he wants to save you from hell to heaven, he wants to give you everlasting life, he wants to have fellowship with you today, tomorrow, and forever. If you will trust in him, if you will believe in him, you will have eternal life. That is a message from scripture to every person. There are people that say, I don't believe in God, but I've heard many times when atheists are dying, they cry out to God, okay? I think deep down, innately, we know there is a God, but you probably have had something in your life that, that you were hurt by, maybe a person, maybe an event, whatever it was, and, and you just think, how could God possibly allow that? There must not be a God. Well, I'll tell you, there's a whole, lot of horrible things in this world, but let's not blame God. It's our fault. We're gonna see in chapter three, sin entering the world. We didn't even get two chapters in the Bible, and then we have sin. We have the curse. So we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's why God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever believes in him, trusts in him, Jesus, should not perish but have everlasting life. How do we know Jesus is the son of God? Because he did great miracles, he healed people, he made the blind to see, he made the lame to walk, he raised people from the dead. But more than that, he was predicted and he fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Old Testament exactly, and all the pictures of the Old Testament exactly as predicted. And not only that, but he rose again the third day. And if he's alive, and if you'll just study the claims of the resurrection, if he's alive, he is God, it's all true, and we can believe in him, trust in him, and have everlasting life. We should not perish, which is hell, but have everlasting life. And then in Ephesians 2, it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of ourselves, it's a what? A gift of God, it's not of works. Lest any man should boast. Some be, so many people think I can earn God's favor, I have gotta be good, I need to be religious, I need to go to mass, I need to go to church, but the Bible says you can never be good enough. That's why Jesus came and died for your sins on a cross. Let this illustration uh, show it to you this way. My left hand representing all of us and, and this phone representing sin. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. My right hand representing Jesus who knew no sin. He was made sin for us that we might be made, watch, the righteousness of God in him. He was perfect. He lived the life you could not live. He died on that cross taking our sin and he says, I'm gonna offer you eternal life as a gift. If you'll just believe in me, you'll be saved today, tomorrow, and forever. You're bought back, you're reconciled back to God. That's good news, friends. That's the message of hope. That's the message of salvation. It's not about giving to charity. It's not about giving to this church. It's not about joining this church. It's not about being water baptized. Some of the things that I've mentioned aren't wrong, aren't, aren't bad, they're actually good, but none of them will save you. What will save you? Trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for your sins and he rose again the third day. If you'll believe in him, you will be saved. Would you please bow with me as we close in prayer with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We've covered some very heavy topics today, but very important, very basic things. The most important thing we've covered was what I just said, that God loves you. Jesus died for you. And that's, that's, that's a message to every person. Whether you are agnostic, atheist, or maybe you're a moralist, maybe you're a religionist, maybe you've gone to church a lot, but you've never made a decision to put your full trust and dependence in Jesus. All people need to do that. The invitation is available to all people. If you will believe in him, you will be saved. I would love to pray with you today if you're here and you are making that decision. Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner, but right now, the best I know how, I put my trust in Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and rose again. I believe in him. If you've done that today, I would love to pray for you. Would you hold up your hand? 
Hold it up for just a second. I won't embarrass you. Hold it up. I see you. Are there any others today? This is a gospel message to, to you, to every person. Have you believed that Jesus died for you and rose again? If you're making that decision, would you hold up your hand so I can pray for you? Is there another one? God bless you. Lord, we're so thankful for eternal life. We're thankful for salvation. We are creatures that have failed. We've blown it. We thank you that we're made in your image, that we are like you in so many different ways, but we're not you. But you loved us, your chief creation. The angels marvel at the salvation you've provided just for us. Lord, help us to first know you, to believe in Jesus, to trust in him. And then, Lord, help us to know that we're saved today, tomorrow, and forever. We have the Spirit of God indwelling us. We now have the power to overcome any problems, any confusion in our lives. Lord, help us to learn to live for you, to live the way that you have taught us through the Scriptures, the way that you lived through Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you for for the one that has uh, trusted in you today and maybe others. Lord, help that person to know they're saved and now they can grow in Christ and never lose what you gave them that is eternal. We thank you for the promise of a father that won't forsake us or lose us and the guarantee of eternal life. In Jesus' precious name we pray these things. Amen. As we close, would you please stand? What a great series as we've been just looking at the Old Testament. The Bible is true. We sang a song last week, The Bible Stands. Just a great uh, several verses. I want to sing through uh, the rest of them as we continue through the series. We're going to do the second verse today. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of men. I love this next part. It's truth by none. By none was ever refuted and doubt it they never can. The world may try, but you can't destroy God's word. Sing the second verse as we close today. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of man. Its truth by none ever was refuted and destroyed. It they never can. The Bible stands though the hills may tumble, it will firmly stand when the earth shall Amen. Listen, if uh, you'd like to have prayer, I will be standing up front uh, right here. And uh, please come and talk to me. I'd love to pray with you about something. And, and I'd also love to give you this book, Why Life Hurts, Understanding Why God Allows Pain, Suffering, and Evil. Especially if you're new and I've never met you, please come talk to me. I'd love to do that. Tonight, we are not having our church service here. We're having Campfire Church. Many of you, hundreds of you have been coming out to this, filling the lawn and our beautiful... 13 and a half acre campus in unincorporated Mundelein. You take Fairfield North, five miles, just past Lakewood Forest Preserve, Lakewood Dog Park. On the right, you'll find Dayspring Bible College. Pull in there. You're gonna have a hard time parking because cars are everywhere, but it's a blast. We fill this hillside and we have church outside at seven o'clock. We have testimonies, we have singing, and it's just special being outside. The weather's cleared out, so it's gonna be beautiful. Bring a lawn chair and uh, come for that. Also, at five o'clock, we're gonna have volleyball and bags. I don't even know what bags is. We used to play this thing called uh, beanbag toss, uh, or some people call it cornhole. So anyways, they're gonna, we're gonna have a lot of fun uh, tonight, five o'clock for the activities, seven o'clock for the service. We hope that you can join us at Campfire Church. What a great morning it's been. When we start with the Bible, we realize that we have a purpose and that we have something to do with our life. Without it, we're lost. Uh, yesterday, we were working, just like Pastor Jim was talking, there's joy in work. And at the end of the day, Luke came up to me, this is my son, uh, 13 years old. He came up to me, he's like, Dad, I wanna show you what we did. And uh, he showed us the front of the building there at Donner's Grove, Belmont Bible Church, and they'd taken this clay-filled rocky soil and filled it in with black dirt. And it was awesome, right? We had fun. Very good. All right, so tell us about the uh, cookie card connect card, Luke. Yes, in your bulletin, you should have found this blue and green card. And if you fill out the information and um, put it, give it to the connect centers in the back of the auditorium, you will get fresh chocolate chip cookies right to your door. All right. And it's a double feature. You either get, you either get cookies or you get connected. Mm -hmm. 
So it's both, it's, it's good both ways. All right, next Sunday, come back and join us. We have a special speaker at 10 and 11, and we get to find out about the real best companion for man, which is the dog. The dog. Right. And if you want to hear about dogs, I could tell you about dogs after the service, but I want to let you guys get out of here. And 11, uh, he's talking, our special speaker, Jerry Bergman, is talking about apes and how they're not our descendants, which will tie in perfectly what, with what we heard this morning. All right, on your way out, Luke, tell them how they can if get the If this is your first time joining us at Quentin Road, we'd like you to have this awesome gift. It is a blue box full of lots of goodies and information about our church. You can get these at the Connect Centers in the back. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you at Campfire Church.